Hey folks, getting a lot more questions coming in at the question submission form at suspiciousobservers.org. Figured I would take a moment to answer a bunch that can be uh, can be answered in rapid fire uh, rather than make a specific video just for each question. So let's just dive into it and here we go. Question number one, how does the earth stop spinning? It does not. That is Doug Vogt's idea. And even though Doug Vogt and I have the same story about what the sun is going to do, some general things about what's going to happen to the earth, he and I have very, very different uh, takes on some of the details. Most of his details come from his study of religious texts. Mine come from geologic evidence and uh, geophysics, solar physics, and galactic astrophysics. You don't need the earth to stop spinning to have the earth turn over, to have a crustal shift, to unlock the crust from the low velocity zone, any of that. So um, if you have that question, ask him. But my position is that it's not going to stop spinning. Why do so many people have brain fog? Well, it looks like you probably have missed our world going crazy videos. Uh, this is actually fairly rudimentary. This is not even something that strays uh, anywhere outside the bounds of mainstream science. It is well understood what changing magnetic fields um, electromagnetism and radiation can do to the human brain. And of course, as Earth's magnetic field is weakening, we are seeing more and more of that uh, from space entering the Earth system. Question we get every single day, is the timeline moving up? I saw this happen. This is a pretty extreme thing. Does this change your timeline? No. The whole premise of this is that we are going to be seeing more and more of these extreme things, and they're just going to be getting more and more extreme as time goes on. So this is precisely what we would be expecting. If anything, uh, I would say that, um, you know, this is really just solidifying the timeline that we have, which by the way, for the major aspect of this, the geomagnetic excursion, and the basically flipping over, um, that would be late 2030s to 2040s. Now, we were just talking about um, how things are getting more and more extreme. That doesn't mean that Earth is going to have power and civilization just gets to trudge along until then. There's a very good chance, as I've said many times in the previous videos, our way of life is going to be completely taken away from us before that happens. And all that needs, you know, for example, all we would need is for the magnetic field to get weak enough that even something small from the sun takes out our power. And it can do that globally. And if it does that globally, there's no coming back when everyone is in the same space. And so at that point, we just sort of wait for the big one and try to adapt as we go. Question, is there any evidence of past disasters having crustal shifts? Yes, we go over this a lot in the disaster uh, movie documentary that we have in some of the other videos that we have. It's everything from looking at the actual geology to the alternating tropical and polar fossils in the Arctic, which seem to be separated by 12,000 years. There's a ton of evidence on this. And if you have that question in your head, go ahead and watch that video and that playlist that I tell you to watch all the time. It is linked below. The Earth Disaster Playlist uh, really, really has pretty much all of the evidence in there. Can we expect structure fires from a major solar event? Absolutely. In 1859, telegraph wires caught on fire. There were even fires in some of the telegraph offices. They unplugged the machines and messages kept transmitting. And the 1859 event, the Carrington event, that was nowhere near what the sun can do. And Earth's magnetic field was relatively strong at that point. So the overall question to structure fires in the great solar event is a big yes. Why do I trust NASA data and NASA images? Well, first of all, I don't trust all of them. I ignore about 80 to 90% of the stuff NASA puts out. But when you've been doing this for a while and you understand how some of these things work, you know which uh, telescopes, satellites, teams, individuals are more prone to just be taking little bits of evidence and then saying, oh, that must be this, that must be this. My apologies, Chandra. Uh, Chandra's X-ray telescope basically interprets everything as a black hole. Like every, every little thing they see is a black hole. But on the other side of that, this isn't just me here. It's not just me here doing the research and then sometimes getting a link or an article from you guys. The number of professors, NASA scientists, people from the ESA and other organizations who are frankly too scared to come out and 
challenge a lot of the mainstream theories and I don't blame them. Um, they do send emails, they do send messages, they do share papers. And when they are saying, hey, this is who I am, it's coming from the inside, I think you're onto something here, I think you're right, I'd like to know what you think of this or see if this fits into the bigger picture. It does breed a lot of trust, especially when a lot of those things are where we've managed to put all the bigger pieces together or they've allowed us to make predictions that have turned out to come true, uh, an overwhelming percentage. And so, no, I don't trust everything that comes out, but when they start to wake up, I take notice and I at least give credence and look at that a bit further. And oftentimes that seems to work out. Uh, we need energy after the shift, after batteries go down. What are we planning to do? I have no idea. If you have any ideas, please share them. I don't know how to build a transformer. I don't know how to do what Tesla did, any of that. Um, but hey, if you do, please share it with the rest of us. <clears throat> how long will we need to be underground? Not as long as many of you think. The underground aspect of this is really needed for if the micronova happens uh, while it's up above your head, uh, when any of the pieces of the micronova are coming down, you certainly don't want to be too far underground if uh, you are in one of the zones where the continental waves are coming. You're either going to be washed over and flooded out or trapped beneath the muck in the mud and not able to get out afterwards. Um, it's basically for extreme situations. Uh, another one of those would be the climate will be pretty extreme after this. The storms, the lightning, the hail, the wind will be pretty extreme. And so it will be a, advantageous to have somewhere that one can retreat. But no, it's not like you're gonna be sitting there in caves trying to survive for years and years and years. No. Well, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, there was a question about flooding the ionosphere with electricity, can that help? And the answer is no, that would make things worse. Um, that's literally just going to, and I, I know where that's coming from, that's coming from this idea uh, that, hey, wait a minute, if, if more space radiation is coming through, couldn't we just put more charged particles up there to help deflect or help absorb? The answer is just no. All that's going to do is make the weather worse, make the arcing to the ground worse in the great solar event, etc. Um, this next question is where we're going to cut it off today and we're going to show a couple more things after uh, that. But the question was, why do so many people think all they have to do is pray? That just if they have their faith in Jesus, that will save them. And we similarly get questions like, Ben, are you sure all of this prepping makes a difference? Are you sure all this awareness makes any difference? I'm pretty sure that all I need is my faith and to pray and that's how I'll be saved. Let's talk about that a little more here. Hey everyone. I wanted to share with you a story that I just heard on a video and the story was a retelling of the story, uh, but it was retold by one of the individuals who I respect as much as anyone else in the world. His name's Josh Hudson. Um, not only because of who he is, but just how much information is crammed into his head. And I think it's really applicable to observers who take the stance that I don't need to do anything. I don't need to prepare. I don't need to be aware. God will save me. My faith in God is going to save me. And whether that's applied to potential for World War III to come around, economic collapse, the risk of a solar flare to our modern way of life, the ongoing geomagnetic excursion, the magnetic pole shift. And I want to reframe this for you in a little bit of a way that does not require any of you who think that way to stop that belief. Um, or, or even remotely close to challenge that belief. There was a crash at sea. Two men survive. They make it to an island. And one guy's like, we've got to figure out some way to get off this island. We, we can't die here. And the other guy's like, it's okay. God will save us. The next day, one of the flare guns that was in the, cra uh, the crashed vessel washes ashore. And the first guy grabs it and says, we can use this. If we see a plane, if we see another boat, we see anything, we can signal to them that we're here. And just so happens, later that afternoon, they saw a helicopter going around the other side of this island. And the guy's like, come on, run over here with me. We got a signal to them. And the guy's like, no, we don't. 
God will save us. And so the guy runs around to the other side of the island, shoots off the flare gun towards the helicopter. It doesn't work. They don't see it. He comes trudging back to the other side. The next day, a piece of the boat washes ashore. And the first guy's like, we can use this. We can modify it. We can put things together. We can make a raft and get out of here. The other guy doesn't want to hear any of it. He's like, no, we don't have to do that. God will save us. So the first guy's like, I'm not listening. I'm building a raft and I'm gone. He successfully builds a raft. And before you know it, the religious man is watching him sail off into the distance. Who knows if he made it? Who knows if he didn't? Turns out, day after day goes by. Nothing happens. No food. Scant amounts of water. The guy's literally sitting there dying, and yet he still holds on to his belief that God will save him. He finally waits too long, and he dies. He gets up to the pearly gates, and boy, is he mad. He says, God, I spent my whole life believing in you, preaching your word, having absolute faith and trust in my love for you and my belief in you. Why did you let me die? Why didn't you save me? And God says to him, I sent you a flare gun. I sent you a helicopter. I sent you wreckage to make a raft. I did everything I could to give you the tools to save yourself. All right, so why did I tell you this story? What does it have to do with you? Well, what sort of information are you consuming? What YouTube channels are you watching? Can you go get stuff to help you prep? Physical items, books, knowledge? You're commanded to have the eyes to see those of you who have that God will save me mindset and the ears to hear. You're listening and so you're obviously using both of them. But essentially, you know, I obviously don't have a crystal ball. But if you think that the Micronova is going to go off up ahead of you and you could just sit there and pray and somehow the rays won't hit you. Or if the giant wave is coming right at you and God's just going to throw Noah down there, sorry, Moses, and he's just going to part, part the tidal wave so it doesn't get you. You're being given all the tools right now. And I don't consider myself an agent of God. I just happen to be part of this existence. And there are other people in this existence who are giving you tools that you need. Undeniably. And I think that one of the reasons why so many who say, no, all I have to do is pray, you know, all I have to have is my faith and I'll be saved is because you have this idea in your head that this thing is going to be worse than it actually is. It's not literally going to wipe out the planet. Yes, species go extinct every single time this 12,000 year cycle rolls around. Yes, the biosphere takes a pounding every time this 12,000 year cycle rolls around. But never forget, during the worst of these events of the last 100,000 years, Le Champ, less than 4% of the species disappeared. Of the species that didn't go extinct, they had 5 to 50% hits to their population. Yeah, that's still a thing. That's still a serious thing. But it's not to the point where the only thing that can save you is your faith. Especially not when you are being told, if that is your faith, to have the eyes to see. You're not told to just sit there and do nothing. Something to think about.